Savannah, Georgia, 1820. This port city of 7,000 people is about to be hammered by three crises that will bring the city to its knees. The first calamity is financial. A nationwide panic, the first in American history, wipes out the holdings of the cotton-based market and causes widespread poverty, upheaval, and economic collapse. On the heels of this crisis comes another, a terrible fire that destroys one-third of the city, raging unchecked in the northwestern edge of town and working its way inward. 1820 was a disastrous year for Savannah. It started right at the beginning, the second week, January 11th. A fire broke out in Boone's livery stable. It spread to Ellis Square, where there had been some gunpowder stored in the market illegally. Uh, it exploded and sent the fire all over the area. It, it burned for two days and destroyed much of the city, burning all the way east to Avercorn Street. The fire was a herald of the next terror, a dreadful pestilence that would leave hundreds dead in its wake. Well, there were unusually heavy rains in the spring and fall over top of the burned out buildings and the ruins from that terrible fire, which left clean standing water, which was ideal breeding conditions for the Aedes aegypti mosquito, which was the vector or the carrier of yellow fever virus. It likes clean standing water um, in urban areas. The conditions were just perfect for breeding mosquitoes. Historians believe that yellow fever in the Western world is a legacy of the North and South American slave trade because the Aedes aegypti mosquito originated in Africa. The first outbreak in the Western Hemisphere was on the island of Barbados in 1647. And in the North American English-speaking colonies, the first outbreak was in New York in 1668. An extraordinarily severe outbreak of yellow fever occurred in Philadelphia in 1793, killing 5,000 people and causing another 20,000, including the entire federal government, to flee the city. Dr. Benjamin Rush was the first to identify the Philadelphia illness as yellow fever, but he misidentified its cause as rotting coffee on a waterfront wharf. In an age before modern medical practices and an understanding of the relation of germs to disease, the cure could be as dreadful as the illness. Unaware of the true cause of the disease, doctors relied on accepted practices for the day, which proved to be ineffective, and to our eyes, even gruesome. A common belief was that the illness resulted from an imbalance of bodily fluids, so patients were routinely bled, sweated, puked, and purged. The problem was they didn't understand what caused it. The greatest ravages of this epidemic were spread along the streets and lanes which were crowded with old wood houses. In a state of partial decadence, were badly ventilated and over tenanted with non-residents or strangers to the climate. In such places, the scenes of sickness, misery, and ruin were awful, shocking, and well fitted to inspire a melancholy sentiment of the shortness, uncertainty, and insignificance of life. Throughout the 19th century in southern coastal cities, the time between the 1st of May through the first killing frost in late October or November was called the sickly season, and fevers of all sorts, including malaria, were part of daily existence. These fevers claimed victims in coastal Georgia since the earliest days of the colony. In 1820, physician William Waring combed the historical record for evidence of earlier unrecognized outbreaks. These diseases as a whole were really devastating. I don't think people quite realize what the level of mortality was early on. 50 out of the first 114 colonists were dead within the first year. William Waring estimated that between 1807 and 1820 that some 4,000 people had died of yellow fever. 
uh, that this was a problem that had been around that people just hadn't recognized. I think it was just terrible. I just don't think people today can, can sort of understand how terrible it was. The initial phase occurred after infection from three to five days. And in that initial phase, you would have a headache and nausea and fever. And most people uh, recovered from that. You improved, but then about 10 to 20% of people did not improve. They entered the toxic phase when you just got a terrible, terrible headache. Um, kidney failure would occur, and eventually um, you would have bleeding from your eyes, your mouth, and your ears. And 20 to 50% of the people that entered this toxic phase would eventually die of their symptoms in a couple weeks. It is well known that the prevailing fever is not only frequent in its attacks, but very malignant in its nature, and is not at this time confined to any particular portion of the city. Let them call the disease the endemial fever, the bilious fever, the yellow fever, or the black vomit still. Its effects are very mortal. The yellow fever virus goes specifically to liver cells. And if we kill that factory, the liver factory, we get yellow. We turn jaundice. And that's where that term yellow fever came from. Well, if you don't have a functioning liver, you're not processing your waste. You're not able to make things that keep our blood thick enough to be able to get poisons out of our body, and then other systems fail thereafter too. A number of things came together in 1820 to make this an epidemic of yellow fever. Of course, we had the fire that happened in January, and then those terrible rains in the, in the spring and the summer. But then also the rise of the maritime commerce with all of these new ships bringing in goods were also bringing in fleas and mosquitoes and, and critters that cause disease as well as all these new people coming into town to rebuild the city. They were fresh blood for the mosquitoes which caused the epidemic. And hundreds of people um, succumbed to the disease, including a large number of members of the African American community whose deaths were not documented accurately in, in the tolls that we took in the newspaper. And thousands of people fled the city to get out of the way of the epidemic. In their desperate attempts to eradicate the illness, public leaders focused on sanitation, cleaning up trash in the streets. They also worked to drain the swamps and marshes surrounding Savannah, believing erroneously that bad vapors, known as miasmas, emanating from the marshes were the source of the disease. The reality was much more simple and insidious. Yellow fever is a virus. The yellow fever virus likes to go into liver cells and replicate there, but requires a transmission source through mosquitoes. And so if man is around where those mosquitoes are, and that viral particle is around that can be transmitted between the two, it's gonna find a, a, a breeding ground, if you will, to then cause its disease. The year 1876 saw the last and worst of Savannah's epidemics, with more than a thousand people killed. The disease continued to plague southern cities until the early 20th century. A Cuban physician, Dr. Carlos Finley, first identified mosquitoes as the transmitters of the disease in the late 19th century. No one took him seriously until an army physician named Walter Reed, sent to Cuba during the Spanish-American War, conducted experiments that proved Finley's hypothesis. Mosquito eradication efforts began in earnest, followed by the development of an effective vaccine in the 20th century. Today, yellow fever is a distant memory in Savannah and the rest of North America. But this deadly disease still ravages much of the rest of the world, including wide swaths of South America and Africa. It's estimated nearly 200,000 people contract yellow fever each year, and up to 30,000 die from the disease. The dreadful pestilence that once gripped Savannah is alive and well in the developing world.